started with our next presentation. To uh, introduce Burgess Jewels. Brianna was a summer fellow here at the CDSC, so she's an old favorite here. She also works at uh, Mass. I shouldn't say old, I guess. She's a young favorite, a young favorite here, but she's been around for a little while. Um, so she's going to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, and thank you everyone for joining us. I have the pleasure of introducing Burgess Jules, who is the University and Political Papers Archivist at the University of California at Riverside Library. There, he manages university archives, political papers, African American collections, and community archives for a project. Um, his previous work with community archives and American, African American collections include leading projects at the Black Metropolis Research um, Consortium at the University of Chicago, and designing and securing grant funding for the DC African Archives Project at George Washington University. Burgess helps lead the Inland Empire Memories um, Consortium at the University of California Riverside Library, which is a community-owned consortium of cultural heritage organizations and the goal of uncovering and sharing the extremely diverse history of inland Southern California. He is the co-director of a 2016 IMLS funded national forum grant to host a series of meetings across the country that will explore strategies and tools for integrating community archives in the national digital platform. In addition to his community archives work, Burgess is interested in the rich potential that social media and web archives hold for contributing to more diverse library research collections by helping to counter existing silences on our historical records through inclusion of more voices and traditionally marginalized communities. He's one of the principal investigators on a 2015 funded project for social media archived in the Andrew Mellon Foundation titled Documenting the Now. And this is supporting scholarly use and preservation of social media content. The goal of the project is to build an open source and cloud-ready tool that will capture tweets and their associated metadata and digital content for long-term preservation by archivists and analysis by researchers, researchers and others. Burgess received a Master's in Library Sciences with a specialization in archives and records management and a Master's in African American Studies from Indiana University in 2009. In addition to his work as a professional archivist, Burgess is a doctoral student at the History Department in UC Riverside. So I'll have Burgess come up and he'll talk about the ethics of documenting and social movements. Thank you. All right, thanks Brianna. I'm doing a lot of stuff apparently. Um, all right, and thanks uh, David for inviting me here and especially to talk about uh, this subject of ethics as we um, work in this new space of uh, social media, web archives. Um, it's a conversation I think that needs a lot more attention, especially in the archives um, world and the library world. I think um, scholars uh, on that side, uh, there's been a little bit, a uh, little bit more uh, sort of interest in sort of the ethics of collecting. A lot of it having to do with you know the fact that you have to deal with IRBs and all that. But um, you know, so you have a little encouragement there. But I think generally uh, we need more uh, information, uh, more, more discussions around the topic. All right, so the dramatic rise in the public's use of social media platforms to document events of historical significance presents archivists and others who build primary source research collections with a tremendous opportunity to collect, preserve, and make this type of data accessible. But with this opportunity also comes a responsibility for libraries and archives to acknowledge and address the potential pitfalls involved with collecting large data sets of social media and keeping them for the long term. And we should be prepared to do this work under an ethical framework of care that doesn't support state surveillance, that doesn't compromise people's safety, disregard their rights as content owners and creators, or that presents their data in ways that distort um, platform users' original intent. People from historically marginalized communities in the United States, especially young African Americans, have found new agency through these social media platforms because they facilitate community engagement, information sharing and consumption, and message amplification in somewhat unmediated ways. Uh, this is a, um, a uh, study from the Pew Research Center um, that focused on uh, African Americans' use of Twitter. Um, and what they found is that young African Americans by far are using um, Twitter at much higher levels than any other group uh, in the United States. Um, and this could help us understand the phenomenon of black Twitter, for example. 
we've seen countless examples of African Americans sharing their feelings about the value of social media, uh, in this case Twitter, and what it means for allowing them to create new narratives. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes uh, from DeRay McKesson, um, who became well known during the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, and, and that started in 2014. Um, and here he's talking about what he sees as the value, or what he saw as the value of Twitter um, during the Ferguson protests. And I'll go ahead and read it for the folks in the back who may not be able to see it. Um, what Twitter has done specifically for traditionally marginalized and underrepresented communities has redefined the public sphere. When I think about Missouri, people would have convinced you that we just did not exist in, 20, in August 2014. Twitter was where the links were shared, it was where the images were shared, Literally, when people were told what was happening, it galvanized the nation. And this is DeRay speaking um, on the, I think it was uh, an event around the 10th uh, anniversary of Twitter, um, Twitter's founding. So these platforms um, have played a major role in helping to amplify the voices uh, and the causes of those seeking change from their governments and fellow citizens. Um, for example, you know, we've seen uh, social media and cell phones continue to play a vital role in helping um, activists widely share information at a rapid pace and to a large number of people as a way to help sustain social activism. A good example of this is how Twitter has been used uh, to amplify voices during protests around police violence against African American communities uh, over the past couple of years. In Ferguson, Missouri, for example, Twitter emerged as the main amplifier after the killing of Michael Brown by a white police officer in August 2014. Ferguson was the catalyst that made Black Lives Matter go national. And since the movement took off, it has produced massive amounts of social media records uh, that future researchers and students can use to study the movement. And this is a, a, a tweet from uh, Dean Freelon, um, who wrote a really fascinating, who was one of the authors of a really fascinating report on uh, Ferguson and the use of social media um, during the uh, Ferguson, during the protests, this was a report um, co-authored by uh, Dean um, Meredith Clark and uh, Charlton McElwain, and the title is Beyond the Hashtags, Ferguson, Black Lives Matter, and the Online Struggle for Offline Justice. I highly recommend you check it out because they work with a, a data set of 40 million tweets that they bought from Twitter um, uh, to look at, and they really dig deep into um, looking at how, how the movement sort of went viral, basically. This is an image of um, Alexis Templeton, uh, one of my favorites, um, one of the key young local uh, activists um, during the Ferguson protests. Um, and if I have a chance, maybe not during the talk, but during the discussion, um, we had an event recently where Alexis was um, a, a panelist um, talking about the value of, uh, on a panel, talking about the value of social media during the movement. Um, and hopefully I get to share that, but if not, I'll share the link so you can get to see that. Um, so we also saw the tremendous value of uh, cell phones and social media platforms during the Arab Spring uh, uprising in Egypt in 2011. Um, and Laura Baladi, uh, in her powerful article, Archiving a Revolution in the Digital Age, Archiving as an Act of Resistance, uh, writes powerfully about the value of social media platforms and how citizens' use of these platforms via cell phones uh, during the Arab Spring was vital to the success of that uprising. Um, as African Americans' access to these traditionally privileged digital information spaces continues to grow, what challenges should archivists um, and scholars pay close attention to as we collect and preserve social media records uh, that document the movement for black lives, for example. Uh, how do we build these collections and use them in ways that prioritize the safety of people represented within these data sets? As archivists, we're trained to appraise, collect, and build research collections and to care for those collections over time. Uh, and that has been a relatively simple process uh, because until recently, most of the collections we've worked with have been paper-based. But the format landscape is a bit more complicated right now. And as our work has moved into the digital space, digital images, digital audio, disks, hard drives, among other things, bring unique challenges having to do with uh, bit rot and general uh, digital obsolescence, right? Um, 
we've done a, a relatively decent job with web archives since there have been a good number of folks working in that space uh, for over 20 years and the Internet Archive uh, comes to mind as being a leader uh, in that space. But social media data presents some of the same issues, um, but in many ways the challenges of collecting and preserving it uh, seem more critical and even dangerous. And that's because, um, and that's partly because of the publicness, accessibility, abundance, and personal nature of social media data. For those reasons, uh, archivists and others working with this kind of data must practice an extra level of care when dealing with collecting uh, social media. Uh, and that care has to revolve around all of our decisions during this work, including our appraisal decisions, uh, the tools we build, how long we keep the data, who can access it, when and how. While social media platforms have democratized information sharing and how news about events uh, is consumed, they're also perfectly set up for surveillance activity. Uh, by the state, uh, precisely because they are public information sharing spaces. And we're starting to see the implications of that surveillance activity, especially as it relates to monitoring protest activity. Archivists are not the only ones interested in this kind of data. And we need to ask ourselves how our collections of social media data and the tools we build to collect that data will be different than those built by law enforcement and private uh, security firms, private security companies. So earlier this, I think it was earlier this year, it could have been last year, The Intercept, uh, which is an online um, news magazine, published a really amazing report that talked about um, the, basically the CIA has an angel funding arm, right, uh, called NPTEL. Um, and this is part of the CIA where they have money basically to invest in companies that can help them do their jobs better. Um, and what uh, the, the Intercept um, reporting revealed is that one of the main things that the CIA is interested in is social media uh, data mining, right? And so at least four of the companies um, of the 38 that were disclosed in documents that uh, the Intercept found were, exp were expressly interested um, in building tools and strategies around social media um, data mining. Um, one of them is uh, data miner, uh, Pathar, uh, Geophedia, and I think, I don't see the other one up there, but that this is, an, uh, you know, the investment, there is a quote from The Intercept um, uh, reporting that says the investments appear uh, to reflect the CIA's increasing focus on um, monitoring uh, social media. Um, and I highly uh, suggest you check out this article because it's just really mind-blowing. I'm surprised it hasn't um, gotten more attention that, you know, the federal government has, uh, you know, as, as part of, of its work is funding companies to, 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 um, that build tools to dig into your data. Um, several of the companies um, being funded uh, by the CIA focus on social media data mining, but one in particular has been popping up uh, in the news uh, recently because it seems to be a favorite of local police departments uh, and even federal agencies like the FBI, and that's uh, Geophedia. And there's just been a lot of headlines with this company. It's they, they see law enforcement, I don't know if you know they have like a really great sort of trial period or whatever, but uh, local law enforcement companies just are really interested in using this in this uh, using this tool, and so here we see uh, this is a list. I just have some headlines here from uh, news reports over the past uh, probably year. Um, here is in Seattle, uh, police secretly uh, and illegally purchased tool for tracking your social media posts. Um, here in Oakland, this recently came out. Uh, Oakland cops quietly acquired social media surveillance tool. Uh, police in Baltimore surrounding communities using Geophedia to monitor social media posts. Um, Oregon DOJ employee gathered info on Black Lives Matter tweeters. Denver police may be reading your Facebook posts. Um, this is from the, uh, the ACLU. And here is a, a, a public document um, from the DOJ uh, solicitation for companies um, Basically, they're saying they're, they're gonna purchase um, uh, 
software from Geopedia because they're interested, uh, and they mention it right there, they're interested in, in social media mining. Um, so this is very alarming. Uh, the, the ACLU has been trying to shed some light on this um, issue for a while, and in one of their recent reports that came out um, last month, um, they did a great job in articulating, in articulating why this type of surveillance was especially dangerous for people of color. And I'll just go ahead and read this. Uh, the racist implications of social media surveillance technology are not surprising. We know that when law enforcement gets to conceal the use of surveillance technology, they also get to conceal its misuse. Discriminatory policing that targets communities of color is unacceptable and secretive. Sophisticated surveillance technologies supersize the impact of racial profiling and abuse. And in many cases, um, we know from the ACLU um, and the Intercept reporting that these companies specifically market their ability to monitor protests um, uh, to, to local police departments. Um, this is a screenshot of a Geopedia email um, to a police department in California. This was part of the uh, ACLU reporting. Uh, and here it's just saying, you know, I'd also suggest utilizing Geofeed Streamer for the Ferguson situation. Uh, let me know if you have any questions regarding your account getting logged in, right? And so there are tons of documents that show that this is sort of the hook that they're using uh, to sell this type of um, surveillance uh, uh, tool to local law enforcement. And local law enforcement are purchasing these tools largely uh, in secret. And the real life implications end up looking something like this, right? So this is an image of two prominent activists, uh, Duray McKesson, who I mentioned, uh, uh, who I quoted earlier, and Jonetta Elzey, uh, being labeled as threat actors uh, by a private security firm, uh, Zero Fox, right? Uh, this threat assessment was, um, uh, is related to uh, the Baltimore uprisings uh, from the spring of 2015 after the police killing of, um, of Freddie Gray. So it's a really scary situation because these companies are interested in selling this data to law enforcement as a way to punish people for being active citizens. Um, Ed Summers is a uh, software developer at the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities at the University of Maryland. And he's also a co-principal investigator with me um, on the DocNow social media archiving project, um, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, about it later. And Ed and I have been collecting social media data around protests for the past two years as sort of uh, uh, test cases for sort of thinking about how we uh, build tools and, and policies around this work. And when he first published a blog post about a Ferguson Twitter data set um, that contained 13 million tweets that we collected during the first uh, couple weeks of Ferguson, um, a private security firm was one of the first people to reach out to, to him asking if they can have access for that data, right? Um, because it happened that they had gotten sort of the second half of August as far as collecting tweets, but they were missing, I, I guess they caught on too late, right? Like, like everyone else uh, in, in the media, and they were missing the first two weeks um, of, of, of Ferguson. So he wanted to see if, if we would share that data set uh, with them, which we obviously didn't. Um, but you know, that, that is, you know, that, that's, a, that's part of the issue, right? Um, it's a real concern for people in our profession uh, to be aware of. Uh, for example, how do we make sure that the massive Twitter data set um, uh, being built right now at the Library of Congress um, doesn't become a tool that these groups can use against already marginalized people whose only request is that the police stop killing them? Uh, how will the Library of Congress uh, respond to requests for that data from private security firms and law enforcement? Right? I'm not sure how many people in here knew that um, when Twitter was founded, somehow this happened that Twitter made a deal with the Library of Congress, the most important library in the United States, that all tweets ever published would be archived at the Library of Congress. So that is happening right now. Any tweet you send out is going directly into a database uh, into the Library of Congress. There's currently no access to it. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I'm not sure how they're working around that. Hopefully we'll get some answers. 
um, soon, but that is there, right? And what sorts of protections will be built um, around that content? Uh, part of the answer is that we have to engage directly with people um, generating social media data to understand how our work in collecting this type of data might affect their lives. Um, I think that will be key in helping us develop strategies around the collection, preservation, and access of this type of content. Um, it's difficult work, but I think uh, uh, it's possible. Um, and another part uh, of the answer is to build tools for collecting this kind of data that are driven by ethics and are built with care and consideration uh, for the people's lives uh, documented in these data sets. Because the line is pretty thin when it comes to the tools being developed for this, um, to collect this data, whether it's for law enforcement or for research uh, purposes. Uh, in many cases, it's really just about who is doing the work, right? That, that, uh, that is what decides how, how people will be um, affected because the work looks very similar uh, in, in both spaces. Um, one of the interesting things uh, about the marketing materials for a lot of the uh, social media data mining sites um, is that they use some of the same uh, language and the same hooks that archivists use to talk about the value of this type of content, right? Uh, we talk about um, you know, location data and why that's important so we could understand how people in Ferguson are talking about uh, 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 the movement versus people in Pullman, Washington, right? Um, we use uh, all the, you know, the great keywords, right? Um, we're interested in collecting keywords. We're interested in collecting hashtags. Um, and, you know, this is the same type of language, you know, we use in our, uh, that we use in our um, uh, grant proposal, you know, to get funded to build uh, this tool that we're working on. So I think it's uh, uh, something we really need to think about. And the features look, you know, pretty similar as well, right? So this is a screenshot of another Geopedia uh, email um, from the company to one of its customers, right? Um, and it's saying we've, we've added new content to our collection containing social media posts from the scene of protests in Ferguson, Missouri. Click below to view the collection now, right? And so this is, you know, this is in some ways what we're going for, the tool that we're building, something very simple, a simple way to deliver, um, uh, you know, a, a data set to a person, right? Um, you can click to view the collection, you can get a preview of some of the images and some of the tweets uh, that are in the collection. So, um, you know, because the technology behind sort of building, uh, as I know from uh, Ed, who's a software developer, I know nothing about building software, you know, the technology behind collecting tweets is not really that complicated, right? So anyone can do it. Um, it is just about, you know, what values uh, that, that person has, right, uh, who's, who's building uh, that tool. So what are some models for libraries and archives uh, to do this work? Um, there are several, um, but I'm going to focus on one that I'm involved with because, you know, what's the point of a public presentation without some self-promotion. Um, and so uh, DocNow, um, docnow.io is the website if you want to check it out. Um, is a project that was funded by the Andrew uh, Mellon Foundation uh, in 2015, um, where our purpose is to build a cloud-ready, free, and open source application that collects tweets, associated web content, and metadata. Um, supports uh, vis data visualizations and exports and sharing of data. Um, but we're also interested in addressing ethics, rights, privacy concerns um, for collection, preservation, and access to uh, social media data. Um, and on top of that, we're interested in uh, building a community around social media archiving because we know that we don't have um, all the answers. So that's probably the thing I've been uh, the most proud of is we, we've been really transparent um, with the work that we, we've been doing. Uh, we tweet about it, we have a Slack channel where we talk about development, where we talk about some of the ethical issues um, uh, that, that are happening. Um, we have 200 people in our Slack channel and it's growing every day. Um, we have a really great advisory board of about 22 scholars, uh, archivists, librarians, journalists, a really uh, diverse set of people who can help us uh, really make sense of some of these issues and really translate uh, uh, those issues into the tool that we're building. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to spend too much, too much time talking about this tool. I really want to 
hear what the audience has to say and I, I want to engage uh, in a conversation because that's how we've been doing a lot of our learning uh, over the past year um, in looking at some of these issues. So I'll leave it there and uh, this is how you can get involved. Anyone here could be involved in the project. You can join our Slack channel. Uh, we will accept you. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, we're on Medium where we post about the work that we're doing. Um, and that's our website down there. So join us, be involved if you're interested in this topic. We're especially interested in students, um, grad students, undergrads, uh, you know, becoming involved in this project. We're interested in people who use Twitter um, telling us about, you know, how they want their information to be archived for the future because there are several different people out there um, uh, collecting your information. Um, and I think you should have a say uh, as to how that information is saved and what it's used for in the future. So, thank you. Well, I just want to jump in because I'm going to talk about some of the same things, but <laughs> from a different perspective, as right. someone who's involved with this project, I want to get a sense of how optimistic you are about this whole process of collecting and archiving. I mean, I wish everyone had your ethical standards for collecting this, but obviously most of the corporations out yeah. there don't exist yet yeah. are doing this. And so as you sort of get deeper into this project, um, you know, where do you stand now with that mission of kind of pressing change in a more productive and optimistic way? Um, you know, you're doing this with corporations and things out there that don't have any of this. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know, I mean, optimistic, I don't know. I think we just do the work. Um, I think we see a need um, to sort of put ourselves in between the corporations that build these platforms that allow people to use these platforms to create data and information. Um, we're in one small space where we're building collections, we're archiving, right? And so we see our use as sort of fitting right in that space and we're bringing um, um, you know, our values with us, right? Um, and a lot of a lot of projects just don't do that or have no concern uh, about doing that because it seems hard because it's not a, a, a technical thing you could build or it's not you know so it's about engaging with people and sometimes you know after you engage with people the answers uh, you come up with are not favorable to you you know because sometimes the answer could be well we shouldn't be collecting this stuff or we shouldn't be collecting this stuff about certain groups or certain people. Um, and that should be okay, you know, um, and I think a lot of people just aren't okay with that. A lot of people see, well, you know, the stuff is out there and it's telling us so much and it could be gone tomorrow. And it's like, well, whose life are you putting at risk by building these tools um, uh, that, you know, th that you have built no sort of values around, right? Um, have you thought about that question? I think that's a, a valid question because we know that law enforcement and the state are going after people based on what they put uh, on social media. And you know, they have a perfectly valid reason that they're sharing with us about why they do this, right? It's because of ISIS, because ISIS uses social media, which is a valid reason, they do. Um, but we know that these tools always end up being used on local citizens, on the local population. And it's always disproportionately people of color and other marginalized groups that are sort of getting the brunt of it. So I think, we as archivists, you know, uh, we need to be part of that conversation as well. We generally leave that uh, to scholars and people that we uh, sort of think of as should be, you know, the ones leading that cause, but we're the ones, you know, right there with the data every day, right? Uh, so we should be involved in that, in that conversation. Yeah, um, I mean, we haven't really figured anything out yet. Um, to be honest, we've been having a lot of conversations, which is exactly what we want to be doing right at this stage. Um, we've talked about some options like anonymizing data, um, which you know works and doesn't work in a lot of ways and is really hard to do. Um, we've talked about, um, so for example, 
Uh, we talked about opting out, and, and as an example, think about you know if you're following uh, a hashtag, uh, let's say of Haiti, which is um, happening. Can I get on the internet right now? Just just. Um, and you're following Haiti, for example, um, and you know you're tweeting about it. Th the idea is that people who are following these hashtags and using them and are interested in them are usually watching the tweets that are going by. Um, so what if, <coughs> excuse me, what if as part of Doc Now, um, you know, if you're if I'm an archivist building a data set with using the Haiti hashtags that as I'm building that data set, right, as I'm collecting the 200,000 tweets or 10 million tweets or whatever, um, every hour um, the DocNow application can send out a tweet using the hashtag, um, maybe send out a tweet twice, three times an hour, saying this hashtag is being archived by the University of California Riverside for this project. Here's a link to the project. And if you choose to click on that link, there could be an option to opt out right, to get your username um, pulled out of the data set, right? And so that's one option we're thinking about um, is how do we automate that whole process? I don't know, I don't have any answers, but that's one thing we're thinking about and you know, it's worth thinking about it, right? Because it's, it's one possible option. Another option is, um, another option is, um, you know, if we don't have answers, if we don't sort of have technical answers, right, can we communicate our values in other ways? So we're thinking about this idea of um, social media data labels, right, or data labels. And we're inspired by uh, Kim, uh, uh, Dr. Willie's work with uh, Mukudu and the local context labels, um, was it Jane? Jane Anderson at NYU, right? And so we're thinking about, so what if you, because some data, I mean, not all data sets are the same, right? So Donald Trump's tweets, like, who cares? Anyone can have that. He's a politician, uh, you know, uh, political folks in the public eye, um, Hillary Clinton's tweets, uh, tweets of government agencies, things like that. But there could be tweets that, are prim um, that include data from uh, maybe underage children right? I mean, underage people using a hashtag, whether it's for a project or, or something else, uh, and that y you may feel like that data set um, needs some kind of protection around it, right? So can we create a set of data labels that will, in essence, uh, communicate our values to the people who will eventually use these data sets that we're building, right? So on that data set, where you, which sort of features a lot of children, you could say, you can put a label on there that says, okay, you can only access this data set if you come to our campus, right? And it will be on a sort of uh, a IP protected computer. Um, or you're not a, a label that says you're not allowed to reshare uh, that data set. Or just a label that says this data set includes information uh, on you know, children under 15 or something. Um, it'll be available for one week. And that's the time frame you have to download it. Share, right, so there's all these things you could sort of create these labels for that communicate your values. They don't control how people will use um, uh, the data, but at least you know for you, it's it's sort of putting the information out there that that's how you expect uh, the data uh, to be used. And I'm just pulling up. So we're sort of in the building phase and discussion phase right now. So this is just a simple. Uh, prototype. It has no real sort of user design on it or anything that we've come up with that we've been letting a few people play around with. Um, uh, and it just has uh, some, some basic functionality that actually was really good to put together because one of our key goals with the project was making it really easy for people to use and that alone will create other issues, right? Because it will be really easy to use so a lot of people uh, will use it. So, um, I mean, this is a search I just created as we're sitting here uh, using the Haiti hashtag, put in 100,000. Uh, and these are some of the basic ideas we're thinking about, about what type of information to return to people uh, as, as they're searching. Uh, and you can see, you know, the top, why isn't this thing scrolling? There we go. 
the top uh, uh, hashtags and 100,000 tweet data set, the most mentioned uh, users, um, common domains, the most referenced URLs uh, in that data set, uh, the people with most followers who are, who are using the data set. Um, there's also all the raw data down here because uh, st uh, researchers especially like to have the raw data uh, to throw in the other tools to do other things. Uh, and so there's that, that, this option. So a lot of these are, uh, these are top tweets and then down here are all the, you know, just a bunch of images. Again, this is not, this is just a sort of concept that we're working with. This is not how the thing is gonna look, but you can see all the images that, that pop up here. Um, so this is not public, but it's one way that we, um, we're thinking about the work and how to build some of this uh, functionality out there. So I just wanted to <coughs> show this real quick. Yeah, your hand was up first right here. No, we would love to be drinking from the fire hose, but we're not. <laughs> Well, these are just some of the basic sort of visualizations that you could do. There are tons more that since we've already figured out how to do it, there are tons more things we can control for um, when the final sort of tool comes out. There are way more sort of uh, visualizations you'll be able to do um, with, with the project. And that's the, you know, that's, that's the whole point, right? There's so much of this data. Um, how do scholars, uh, that was one of our um, uh, arguments uh, in the grant, is we want to create a way for scholars to make sense of some of this data using a free tool that's as robust as some of these paid services out there. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is, you know, we're trying to create uh, some sort of sense making um, and we hope people will be able to use it for that. Uh, well, that's a really specific uh, group of folks, and we're not working with that specific group of folks right now, um, but I could see us doing that work. Um, actually, right now we're planning, um, this is in the early planning stages, um, a, a symposium at Cambridge uh, to take place next year where we'll invite um, uh, Muslim activists to be part of the conversation around social media uh, and activism. But here in the U.S., um, I agree that coalition work is important. Uh, it's important to bring activists and archiving people together to think about this work. And we did that um, in a small way uh, in August of this year when we hosted our, um, our first advisory board meeting uh, in, uh, in St. Louis. And we invited um, activists uh, to be part of the day's um, uh, events. And we had four activists from Ferguson, uh, five activists from Ferguson uh, join us. Um, Rasheen Aldridge, um, Ruben Riggs, Kayla Reed, and um, Alexis Templeton. <coughs> and we had a really amazing conversation. Um, and, you know, I'm not gonna play it right now, but there's an hour and a half long conversation here. Um, where the activists w just told us their story, right? About their lives before, before um, Ferguson, their lives during Ferguson and their lives after Ferguson where some of them have decided to quit the movement altogether uh, because of the trauma sort of they, they, they experienced, right? So I highly recommend checking out this uh, video. Um, they also talk about what they thought the value of social media was or, or the lack thereof um, uh, during uh, the Ferguson uh, movement. They have varying uh, perspectives on that. 
Um, they talked about how they want the movement to be remembered, right? So this was a small slice, um, but I think that type of engagement is important because I'm sure, you know, their feelings sort of uh, um, mirror some of the other folks who are involved in that movement, right? And it's part of the transparency that we're uh, trying to practice uh, with the project. So we hope to always do something like this and to always get the communities that we're in interested in and in archiving um, that use this type of, of, um, of platform uh, involved in the conversations we're having. Um, our thing is we really have no answers and we want to learn from the community. I mean, uh, that's not really my area, um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't participate. I mean, because, you know, no matter what you try to do, I mean, someone will get it somehow, you know? Um, yeah, that's a, that, I mean, that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, I guess you could create safe accounts. Or I, I don't know. I really don't have an answer uh, uh, for that. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, what, what is, anyone else in the room? Here's. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, that's, that's one idea. I mean, one, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, one of the groups of people using coded language right now uh, on, on Twitter to communicate are um, alt-right and racist groups, right? And so this uh, report came out, um, I think, I, I saw it last week, I don't know when it came out, where these groups are coming up with the, all these code words, right? So. You know, I don't remember what they were, but it's like instead of calling someone the N word, they'll call, they'll say like a chair or something. And they have this like, you know, this list, you know, uh, instead of calling, you know, someone Jewish, they'll, you know, call, uh, you know, call them some other. I mean, it's just a crazy like code that this, this uh, group has come up with um, so they could feel, um, uh, so they could still sort of um, discriminate against people in, in that space. So, um, what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember what they were, but yeah, yeah. It was it, it ridiculous. So, yeah. <laughs> it could be. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we we can uh, we can then be the targets. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, you know, I think you've said a lot of really great things there. And I, I think we're just trying to put the power in people's hands, but we also understand that we can't really control what people do, right? So, I mean, you have uh, Mufidu, which is a really great platform, and you have, um, uh, and they work with the uh, local context labels, which just an amazing concept, but you still can't control how people use Mufidu or those labels, right? Um, and so, you know, I think what we're trying to do is just, you know, I keep saying it, but we're just, we're really interested in communicating our values and making sure they show up within the school. Because I think a lot of the conversation around, uh, I don't think that conversation around sort of building ethics into technology, it, it's just not happening enough, right? And especially in, in, in our college world, right? I mean, we're fascinated by, uh, by any little shiny object, right? Um, and so, you know, I, we just don't, take the time to really have these deep conversations. And I think what we're saying is it's time to have the conversation. Like, I don't have all the answers right now, um, but at least we're having the conversation, you know, um, and things can come out of that. Um, but, you know, I'd rather build a tool that has these values sort of built into it or has these sort of uh, components that sort of communicate these values and have, you know, 500 people building a collection around Ferguson Right versus having one tool that only three people know how to use, right, and having that that institution that owns that tool be the only place building a collection around Ferguson, right, and so uh, you know we're trying to do several things, um, but yeah, the ethics it's it's a hard question because it's we just haven't had the conversation in my you know space or, or in, in our lab. Yeah, yeah, and you know, again, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm really focused on sort of uh, archivists here as an audience, um, and and um, as far as you know, deciding what to collect and how to collect it, uh, and also scholars and, and and folks doing that research and uh, how to visualize and share that data. Right, those are our two main audiences. Uh, so that's who we're really thinking about. But yeah, I mean, anyone can use this tool, as we saw. I mean, law enforcement will probably end up using Doc Now. You know, what can we do about that? I mean, maybe we can send them an extra email and say, hey, this is what we want this thing to be used for. Um, but we can't stop people from using the tool.
I'm not a digital archivist. That's a whole other person that does that has skills that I don't have. I mean, I was just bringing these issues up uh, because it's it's something, right? And the, the CD will not last forever. Um, I, I hope I, I don't get trashed and laid down. The hard drive will fail. Um, the CD drive will fail. Um, the issues of, of of storage space and folder space when it comes to bringing all these things together. Um, it's like being kept out of like video and audio. So there are all kinds of issues um, that that you could think of there. Um, and I think for for uh, social well tweet data sets, for example, I mean the same types of issues because they're you know, they're saved you know in these strange digital storage spaces, right? Um, people have them on their computers. People have them on thumb drives. People have them everywhere. Um, and so we're thinking about what are the best ways, for example, to preserve. Uh, I think we have uh, we have a set of like 50 million tweets or something right now that we're looking at. They're not publicly available because we didn't uh, seek permission to collect them. Uh, they're only being used as sort of as we think about the tool right now, um, and they'll be destroyed at some point. Um, but how, you know, where do you save that as you're doing the work, right? Um, we think about the uh, ephemerality of tweets, right? And so uh, Twitter doesn't allow you to keep um, deleted uh, uh, tweets of people, right? So Twitter is also in the business of, sh of selling data, right? So you can go to Twitter and buy all the Ferguson tweets, for example, all tweets that use um, the Ferguson hashtag over the past two years. Um, it's been, I think, the most popular hashtag. Um, at least it was in 2014. Um, but what they do is they license you that data for one year. Um, and if you want to keep using it, you have to buy another license from them the next year because that way, that's one way they can control um, how to get people's tweets out of that data set if they've been deleted. So there are all these issues that we have to think about um, too as we're building the tool. We ha we're building our tool based on Twitter's um, development policies and we have to also um, build something that will get rid of people's deleted tweets. So it's, you know, it's, it's a complicated process a lot of things to think.